Um, okay. So here we go. So we're going to talk about neurologic emergencies. So the whole basis of this talk is really to help you guys in these situations and general practice, either prior to referring them, or of course, if not, uh, owners aren't available to do that, um, then the best way that you guys are going to be able to help these parents, uh, sorry, owners, but I call them the pet parents. So here we go. So the main thing we're going to focus on is, of course, head trauma, spinal trauma. A lot of the focus is going to be on head trauma. And in regards to spinal trauma, of course, there's many different varieties from disc disease to FCE. But um, I've talked a lot about those before. And so the main focus is going to be on spinal fractures, just because it's not something that we usually focus on. And just so that you guys have some information on that, what you guys are able to do, because so many of them don't require surgery, surprisingly enough. So to focus on head trauma, if you get nothing else out of this talk, I just want you guys to know that steroids is no longer um, anything and it hasn't been for a while that you need to give or should be giving during any so sort of head trauma case. So in regards to why we are saying this, it's because a crash trial was done, which stands in human medicine and it's corticosteroid randomization trial after significant head injury. And basically it was a 48 hour infusion of steroids. And what they found was that it actually really worsened the overall prognosis of the human patients that had head trauma. So in these cases, you're reaching for an anti-inflammatory. You're not going to reach for steroids. You're going to reach for an NSAID. I don't know where to look. So there's a bigger slide over here. So I'm going to try to focus over here. So in regards to when we're trying to understand head trauma, the biggest thing that you also want to do is just you have to understand normal to understand abnormal. And so just taking it back to basis, you know, the basics here. So when you're looking at intracranial homeostasis, the main thing you're thinking is that your intracranial pressure, it's your pressure exerted by the tissues and fluids within the cranial vault. And that's three main volumes. Your brain is 80% of that, your CSF is 10%, and your cerebral blood volume is another 10%. And those are fixed volumes that, of course, need to be in there, and there's not much movement. It's a fixed amount that we're able to have. Our cranium, as we all know, is poorly distensible, and any small increase in volume is going to lead to a large increase in our intracranial pressure. And if that intracranial pressure goes above 20, then we are looking at death due to our direct effect on our cerebral perfusion pressure. So the main kind of mechanism there or situation that you guys want to be thinking about here is your cerebral perfusion pressure. So your cerebral perfusion pressure equals your mean arterial blood pressure minus your intracranial pressure. That's kind of the basis for everything and understanding what you should and shouldn't be doing when treating these patients. Because we care about our intracranial pressure because it's a direct effect on the brain perfusion. So your cerebral perfusion pressure is your blood pressure gradient across the brain. Normally, we're in the 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury, and you end up with ischemia that falls below 30 to 40 in the normal brain. So that's really important because, of course, if you have a head trauma with different areas of the brain that are going to be injured, it doesn't take them to go down to 30 to 40 before you have really severe um, effects from that. And so your cerebral perfusion pressure is your primary determinant of your cerebral blood flow. So that's why we care about our cerebral perfusion pressure, because that is allowing us to be able to be appropriately having perfusion to our brain, which we all know it's only 2% of our body weight, but it uses 20% of our cardiac output. So though it's a small, small organ in the grand scheme of things, it really is very important and it takes on a lot of that cardiac output. So we need to make sure we're staying properly perfused. The graph that's over on the bottom right hand side of the screen, I took it from BSAVA just because I couldn't figure out how to make it myself. But basically regulation of this value of our normal cerebral perfusion pressure is happening every day. It's happening right now in all of us. And normally we need to stay between 50 and 150. And that's a pretty big variability that you can have in order to be normal and for everything to be working okay. But then as soon as you tip the scale one way over the other, you can have dramatic effects in your cerebral blood flow. So that's something that's just important to note. But again, this is something that's happening all the time. And so because that autoregulation is always occurring, just remember that you have your brain is 80%, your CSF is 10, your cerebral blood volume is 10. And so when you have a head trauma, you're going to end up with an imbalance of those three compartments. 
And then going back to, which is something you guys probably heard about in vet school or learned it once, learned it for the test and then kind of forgot, um, but the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, that really is in regards to how this all is able to work and the normal regulation that occurs on a daily basis. And so normally what will happen is if anything were to shift, there's only so many variables that we're able to change, right? And the easiest ones to change is our blood and our CSF. That's within our cranial fault. So that Monroe Kelly doctrine is really our relationship between the contents of the cranium and our intracranial pressure. And so ways that we're able to alter that on a daily basis is that if for any reason we have increased brain tissue volume, so whether or not it is edema, it's hemorrhage, it was some sort of skull fracture and we have a piece of the skull pushing into the brain, anything to increase that volume, there are ways that we can decrease our CSF, decrease our cerebral blood flow as well to be able to compensate for those changes because we have to still, you can only add up to 100%, right? You can't go more than that or we're going to have severe consequences of that. And that's what the Monroe Kelly Doctrine is. So it's working on a normal everyday scale, but then also it can come into effect if there's minor changes going on in the brain. I always think about it with our mild encephalitis cases, there's significant edema that's going on in the brain. And because that brain is taking up more volume, decreased CSF amounts, decreased blood in the brain, but those patients themselves may not be showing significant clinical signs of elevations of the intracranial pressure until you get to the point that they can't auto-regulate anymore. Ooh. I don't know what that was. Okay, so what, um, what else is occurring in regards to autoregulation? So there's pressure autoregulation as well as chemical autoregulation. So for the pressure, it's really preventing our under or over perfusion. It's mainly at the level of the arteries and the arterioles and any elevated transneural pressure, excuse me, is gonna be vasoconstriction and vice versa. A decrease in that pressure, you can have vasodilation. Again, this is happening all the time. CO2. This is one that I'll always har harp on because it's a potent vasodilator in the brain. So it's different than what you would think about going on elsewhere in the body. You can pretty much between 20 and 80, your cerebral blood flow is going to increase as your CO2 increases and it's pretty comparable to increase. But if you go above 70, you're gonna double your cerebral blood flow. If you go below 20, you're gonna decrease your cerebral blood flow by 40%. Now that reactivity, is well maintained in head trauma to a certain extent. And because of that, it is something that when you have these patients coming in, if you end up needing to ventilate for them, keeping that CO2 in a normal level can be very beneficial. And then of course, oxygen. Decrease oxygen, you're gonna have dilation, which is something in a normal brain that you want, but of course can have bad consequences in our head trauma patients. And then CMR is just our cerebral metabolic rate. So that's something too that we are able to alter. And more important when it comes to the fact of not wanting to increase our cerebral metabolic rate in these head trauma patients due to the fact that we want to be decreasing perfusion as best we can. So once those compensation mechanisms are exhausted, and this is something that can be very, very rapid, such as a dog's hit by a car, bad skull fracture. I mean, it takes a second and those dogs are showing clinical signs versus could be something that's taking, you know, days or hours to go through. And so any small increase in intracranial volume, once those compensations are exhausted, is gonna lead to a very dramatic elevation in your intracranial pressure. And that's when you guys are gonna see those clinical signs. So a lot of the times we're, you know, kind of already behind the game when we are in these patients that present to us and whether they're having Cushing's reflex, which we'll talk about in a second or anything like that, a lot has already occurred. The brain has already done its best to be able to try to compensate for what's occurring, but it's failed basically because it doesn't have enough power to, do, to deal with that increased space that's currently there. So the Cushing's reflex. So that's when your autoregulation has failed and you end up with bradycardia with hypertension. So the reason that we care is that as soon as we increase our intracranial pressure, we're gonna be decreasing that cerebral perfusion pressure. So if you guys just remember this equation that's on the right hand of the screen, it pretty much is summarizes head trauma really well. Um, it's one of the most common questions that we'll give. 
interns or vet students that are coming through because to understand this, it, it makes sense for everything to know, okay, we need to be perfusing the brain. Elevation or intracranial pressure, we're not going to be able to do that appropriately unless we compensate for some way, which is going to be that hypertension peripherally so that we can keep perfusing our brain. So here we have just a diagram just to run through in regards to understand, well, why do we get the Cushing's reflex? So if you have an elevation in your intracranial pressure, you're going to have a decrease in your perfusion. So you're going to decrease cerebral blood flow, which is going to increase your CO2. That is going to be read by your catecholamine center. So you're going to get catecholamine release. It's your medullary vasomotor center. So you get catecholamine release peripherally. So peripherally, you end up with vasoconstriction. That's going to lead to your hypertension. So that's why you guys are seeing that when you check the blood pressure and all of a sudden it's reading 180 and this almost comatose dog, you know what's going on. That's going to be read by your carotid baroreceptors. You're going to get vagal stimulation, bradycardia. So that's why when you see hypertension with bradycardia in these cases, a lot has already happened. And even though this patient has just come into you, we're really kind of already behind, behind the eight ball in these cases. And so we have to do our best to try to do as many things as we can to stabilize them. So other things that you're going to be looking at is blood pressure. So naturally, when we have autoregulation is present, when we have hypotension, we're going to get vasodilation. That's going to increase our cerebral blood volume, increase our intracranial pressure, which of course can be a bad thing when we have a patient who potentially already has elevations or starting to have elevations in that intracranial pressure. Now, when we don't have that autoregulation present in these cases, we're gonna have decreased perfusion and that's gonna to lead to ischemia, which were already one of the things that we're already battling with in certain areas of the brain that are affected. Now, in regards to hypertension, that's going to increase your perfusion and that is gonna assist in occurring or developing the vasogenic edema. So the more pressure that you're sending to into your cranial vault, and unfortunately it's going to just promote the development of the edema, which then that edema in your brain tissue is going to continue to increase your intracranial pressure due to the fact that you, you don't have space for it basically, right? It's just, you can think of it just as a box. You can only fit so much in there. We're bringing it up that edema is really a deleterious effect. So, other things, of course, hypoxemia, why is it bad? Tissue hypoxia is never a good thing. It's going to lead to vasodilation, hypercapnia. You're going to go to respiratory acidosis. That's going to lead to vasodilation, increased cerebral blood volume, increased intracranial pressure. So why does all of this matter and what does all of this mean? I mean, basically, the main thing you want to consider is that you want to get a normal tense of appropriately oxygenated patient with normal CO2. So though it is a very simple idea, of course, we know when these cases can be, come in, it can be tricky to do, but there's also a reason that you want that. It's simple to give a patient flow by oxygen when they come in from a head trauma. You want to do your best to get their blood pressure appropriate. And if you're able to monitor their CO2 or at least get a CO2 value, whether or not you're doing a blood glass, you're able to, if you have to ventilate for them and you have a capnograph on them, just to be able to wanting to keep those values normalized due to the effects that it can have on the brain because keeping them in those normal values is going to overall help you be able to control that intracranial pressure. Hypoxia and hypotension are the two that need to be qu treated quickly um, because oxygenation and fluid therapy are the most effective treatment for elevations in intracranial pressure. So it's not your mannitol, it's not your hypertonic saline. We're going to get to those and those are very important. But the main things you want to be doing as quickly as you can is making sure those patients are oxygenated and making sure they've got appropriate fluid therapy on board, which we'll go to um, be speaking of next. And so for your O2 saturation in these patients, I just saw that that's spelled wrong. Um, you want more of the greater than 94%. You want a PaO2 of greater than 80, PaCO2 greater than 35 to 40, and your systolic blood pressure. You want it between 80 to 140 is basically what you're looking for. General care in these cases, the reason that we talk about elevating the head and not trying to kink their neck in one way versus the other is you don't wanna be obstructing their venous drainage in any way. You want them to be able to be having appropriate um, or adequate venous drainage. You also don't wanna be doing jug sticks on these patients. You don't wanna be placing jugular catheters. 
Um, you don't want to be occluding them in any way. So I know some people will potentially, you know, hold, be holding off or kind of use the neck as a as a guide. You don't want to be doing that. Just kind of stay away from the neck. If they have a collar on, I'll usually say take it off to make sure that we're not having any issues there. Sometimes if these patients need something like an e-collar, if you have to do it, because whether or not they have you know, some sort of ocular trauma or something else going on. Um, it's okay to do, just make sure that it's on very loosely so that it can't obstruct the flow in any way. So you wanna ensure the airway um, and normal oxygenation. So poor ventilation is gonna lead to further secondary injury. Um, a lot of these patients may need to be intubated so that we can ventilate and easy enough, you can always just do flow by. Now, normal thermia, you want to keep their temperature normal so that we're not increasing that cerebral metabolic rate. We want to make sure these patients aren't becoming hypothermic. Also, if you end up with hyperthermia, then they're going to end up panting, they're going to blow up all their CO2, and that's also not something that you want. Um, you also want to be paying particular attention to making sure these guys have appropriate analgesia on board. Urinary catheter, at least make sure their bladder is expressed. These are just general things just to make sure that you guys aren't forgetting about seizure management. We'll talk about that in a second. And something also very easily that you can do is if you have imiprazole there, or if you have compounded imiprazole, it does decrease CSF production by approximately 26%. So usually just a standard dose of approximately a mg per keg a day. You can even do it twice a day if needed. Um, it can help decrease CSF production to help you with that, with the amount of CSF that's going to be in that cranial vault. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually can be very helpful. So other things or other questions that I will get a lot when I kind of have, you know, calls from you guys to say, hey, what's going on? Can I, should I be doing X, Y, or Z? These people can't, you know, refer the patient to you guys. Um, hyperventilation is a big talk. So it definitely can decrease cerebral blood volume by 30%. Um, but the concern about when we hyperventilate these patients, especially if we go below 30, is that once that's done, we can have vasospasming occur that can actually throw you further into a hypoxia. And you can't predict the ischemic effects on the brain that's occurring, and vasoconstriction can produce ischemia in what we call this inverse steel phenomenon or reverse Robin Hood. So what ends up happening is that your damaged area that still needs blood flow, what ends up happening is you have vasoconstriction to the damaged area and it's pulling all the oxygen to your normal healthy tissue, which is great because then you're confusing that normal healthy tissue, but you're stealing from your already damaged tissue that also of course needs help and needs oxygen. So that's why they call it the uh, reverse Robin Hood. And then doing barbiturate comas, um, you want to decrease your cerebral metabolic rate. That's the purpose of it. Um, however, another long-term study, many studies have showed that there's no actual improvement in patient outcome. So in regards to hyperventilation, in regards to a barbiturate coma, not recommended. If you have a patient who, you know, of course has their CO2 up in the 70s or the 80s, then you want to breathe them down. I don't recommend going below 30 though. So if it's something where you are ventilating for these patients, I try to keep them around 30, 35. It's not very often at all that I'll say push them lower than that. You usually want to stay right about 30. So to just kind of run through a case, um, a case that I actually had during residency, just so that we can make sure, just bring it back to a case so that we're all on the same page of what we can be doing with these patients. Um, so Frank was a 12 week old Alaskan Husky that was bit on the head by the other dog in the house. And then of course, we're gonna do our ABCs as always. Well, not me, usually this is you guys or this is the ER service that's doing these, these things. But so our airway, we're gonna intubate if necessary. Our breathing, we're gonna supply oxygen and our circulation, you want a large IV catheter for fluid therapy. Um, isotonic fluids are preferred over hypotonic. So using LRS or normal saline and no longer do we advocate for fluid restriction. So of course you're gonna be giving these dogs normal fluids, but people used to always say, well, don't push the fluids too hard because you don't wanna end up increasing the brain water content. That's not gonna happen. It's not gonna make it so more cerebral edema occurs. You don't wanna be you know, going crazy with your fluids, but I usually don't restrict them. I say treat them as you normally would see fit. 
Um, because if you do aggressive fluid resuscitation, it's usually not going to change your outcome. They didn't find any major effects on the injured or normal brain in these instances. So go ahead and treat with fluids as you see appropriately based on how the patient is presenting. So on presentation, Frank was dull. He had a heart rate of 60. He was panting. His temp was 98. Now his lungs sounded fine. And then he had no other appreciable wounds or trauma except for the swelling of his calvarium. So the very first slide that I had of the CT, which was a very obvious skull fracture, um, that was Frank, and I'm pretty sure it's coming up. Um, but you always wanna make sure you're just gently palpating these patients. So we knew Frank was bit on the head by the other dog in the house. The owner was right there. He didn't shake him or anything like that. But let's say this was a different case or hit by car or something. You have an obvious skull fracture. But then at the same time, also, it never hurts just to run your hand down their backs. The number of spinal fractures that I found during residency when I went to just do a consult on the case, um, you can just run your hands down them. You can feel a step or, or something along those lines because then you know what you're dealing with. Because, of course, you're always wanting to stabilize these patients. We have to make sure cardiovascularly they are stable. Um, however, we also don't want to be forgetting that if they just endured a major trauma, we don't want to be ignoring that fact we want to be as careful as we can with their spine just in case there are other other potential vertebral fractures present so we didn't appreciate anything else with him but with his heart rate just to go back of 60 he's dull he's a puppy he just got bit on his head you're very clearly going to be concerned about the cushing's reflex so our auto regulation has failed we've got the bradycardia with hypertension and again, here's our graph to say, okay, this is exactly what's going on. And so when we see this, we want to reach for our hyperosmolar therapy. We want to say, okay, we've got a catheter in the dog. He's on regular fluids. We're making sure he's got flow by oxygen, you know, and then how can we, how can we help in this instance? And so intracranial hypertension is associated with poor outcomes. We want to do our best to try to improve that. And we have two main ways in hyperosmolar therapy whether or not it's mannitol or hypertonic saline has been in the place since the early 20th century. And the brain is very susceptible to any of these changes because it's composed of a, comprised, excuse me, of approximately 80% water. And so because of that, there's a lot of manipulation that we can do. And when you're using this therapy, just so you know as well, you're going to be affecting the normal brain. You're not really going to be doing anything for the injured brain tissue because a lot of times it has edema going on or there's not much that's going to be able to change in the injured tissue but a lot of your focus is going to be on saving the normal tissue that's there so mannitol um i was actually just asked dr smith the other new neurologist that just started if she has a preference um, of what hyperosmolar therapy to use i always just reach for mannitol it's something i've always done um, she said the same thing of course i don't and hypertonic saline is excellent as well um, mannitol just usually as long as the patient isn't hypervolemic is what I'll reach for. Um, and the reason I like it is it's immediate. So not only does it cause osmotic diuresis, but what a lot of people don't realize is that it causes this transient plasma expansion. And by doing that, it decreases the blood viscosity, which then you get cerebral vasoconstriction. So you have this decreased intracranial pressure secondary to decreased cerebral blood volume. However, you're maintaining your perfusion and that happens immediately and it lasts for approximately 75 minutes. So for some reason, it just makes me feel better knowing, okay, my blood viscosity, we're thinner, but we're still perfusing the right amount of blood. And so it's just able to get there faster and it's immediate that it happens. Um, so we have this hemoconcentration, you get vasodilation, but the hemodilution, you get that vasoconstriction, but we're still perfusing in the right amount, which is what is so green about mannitol and why I probably reach for it first. Now, of course, we also have the osmotic diuresis that occurs. That's slightly delayed. It's approximately 15 to 30 minutes before you get that change. And it's gonna shift the water from your intracellular and interstitial space into your vasculature. Osmotic diuresis, you decrease your cerebral edema, which is one of the main things that we're working on. It also can is a great free radical scavenger and it does decrease CSF production as well. So effects begin within minutes because of that plasma expansion and they peak within 15 to 20 minutes. Duration of effect is approximately two to five hours and your dose is a half to one gram per keg IV over 15 to 20 minutes. 
I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I push it over five minutes sometimes, depending on what's going on. Um, but usually about 15 minutes is appropriate. And there's no benefit of doing a CRI over a bolus. Uh, so usually I just say, go ahead and bolus it um, to give. And then the one thing that you just always want to remember with mannitol is that it's usually going to be um, in your incubator and you want to make sure that you're giving it through, you're either pulling it up through a filter or you're giving it through a filter. I usually find giving it through a filter because you have to give it slow anyway um, works a lot better because when you're trying to pull it up, you're pulling it up quickly and it can take a really long time using the filter. Side effects that we can have is volume depletion. So if you have a hypervolemic patient, reach for hypertonic saline, don't reach for mannitol. It can definitely cause electrolyte abnormalities, nothing of which is usually very concerning immediately. It ends up being if you're needing to use it for many, many days. Um, you can get acid-base derangements, you can get congestive heart failure, you can have a kidney injury, um, usually only if the osmolality gets greater than 320, and I'm usually only worried about it in those cases that are hypovolemic and get mannitol, but it's not common. And then maintaining these patients on IV fluids is also really important. You want to make sure they're staying appropriately hydrated. You don't want to be giving this with furosemide. Um, and then, of course, avoiding the hypovolemia altogether, which you're going to have them on fluids. And then there used to always be, if there's intracranial hemorrhage, if that's present or suspect present, you can't use mannitol. That used to be something that we'd say, but it has actually been shown that it's not a risk. So you can go ahead and use mannitol, even in those cases where we're worried there's something like a subdural hemorrhage or something along those lines. And then a lot of times I'll also have people that'll say, okay, well, I'll get this patient set up for every four hours to get mannitol um, or something along those lines. But it's, it's not recommended for those situations to just have it scheduled out. And it's not recommended to, for prophylactic use, mainly because the effectiveness is going to be related to the degree of elevation of your intracranial hypertension and your associated response is going to decrease as your cumulative dose increases. So the more mannitol you give, the less effective it's going to be. So if I have a dog and I'm, you know, we're going in and we're gonna be doing a craniotomy or craniectomy or, or something along the lines and it's not showing any changes in its intracranial pressure at that moment, I'm not going to give it preemptively to try to prevent it from occurring. So it's not how it works. Um, and it potentially isn't gonna work as well when you actually need it if you end up needing it. My kind of rule for thumb for mannitol is sometimes I'll have people call or say, you know, I don't know if I should give mannitol or not. Usually I would listen to your gut. And if your gut is telling you there's an inkling that's saying you need to be giving something, you need to give mannitol. And a lot of times I'll say, well, I shouldn't give it unless the Cushing's response is present. And the Cushing's response is present. You're already behind, you know, in these patients. And so if you have a patient who's dull, who's showing you signs of elevations in their intracranial pressure. We'll talk about the modified Glasgow coma score in a second. Go ahead and give it. One dose is not going to hurt anything. Um, so at least you can see if there's a benefit. So you don't necessarily need to wait for that hypertension or bradycardia before you give the mannitol, but you don't wanna be giving it just because to prevent anything. So I won't give it prophylactically if I'm gonna go in and do a brain tumor surgery removal or anything like that. One thing to know as well is there is this reverse osmotic shift that can happen. It's not common that it does. And basically what ends up happening is the mannitol can pass from the blood into the brain. Um, that usually happens with, I mean, days and days use of mannitol, really high doses of mannitol. So it can end up becoming, you know, your worst enemy in those cases. But as long as you're using it appropriately, it's not going to happen. Um, and then there's just a blurb on there, as you can see, just don't set it up for every six hour treatment. You may give one dose of mannitol and not need to give any more. So I don't like to see it on the treatment sheet as every four hours, we're going to be giving mannitol. No, you should be assessing your patient to know whether or not you feel like mannitol is going to be appropriate or not. And then hypertonic saline, that's your other kind of go-to. So similar osmotic benefits to mannitol, it's just a less potent diuretic. Um, mechanism of action for hypertonic saline is it does increase our osmotic gradient across the blood-brain barrier. It shifts water from our intracellular, intracellular excuse me, and interstitial space to our intravascular, so same thing. Um, the other cool thing about it is it does dehydrate our vascular endothelial cells, so it improves our blood flow. So your vessel diameter actually ends up getting wider and you can have improved blood flow 
um, due to the fact, but it's a relative increase in that vessel diameter. It's not actually vasodilating, um, but that can lead to reduction in our intracranial pressure um, and increase our oxygen delivery. Um, it can increase our cardiac output, or well, excuse me, and our blood pressure. It promotes reuptake of our excitatory amino acids, which we're, we don't want. It reduces adhesion of our inflammatory cells to the microvascular, so it modulates that inflammatory response. Um, and it is a positive inotropic and immunomodulatory effect. So there's also many benefits. And if you can see from the two ends, oh, whose volume can't hear. Is everyone good now? I just saw some notes. I think we're okay. Good here. Okay. Um, so what, one thing to recognize too between mannitol and hypertonic saline is though they both cause asthmatic diuresis, it's also good to know that they also have two other mechanisms of action that are very different. And so potentially in those patients where you gave mannitol, you saw some benefit, but not great, you can absolutely you know, give the other. So I gave mannitol, it didn't seem to do what I wanted. You can absolutely try hypertonic saline. So for hypertonic saline, I just have the doses up here for you guys in regards to what your concentration is and the dose that you can give. You also want to know you can combine it with a colloid just to prolong its volume expansion effect. So usually combining it with pedasarch um, will be your go-to. And usually give that as a one to two ratio. So you always want to reassess these guys after administration. Again, you're always going to follow with a crystalloid therapy. Side effects electrolyte abnormalities, and of course, you're giving hypertonic saline, you wanna be worried about sodium. So in the patients, if you have a hyponatremic patient, you don't wanna be using hypertonic saline, which of course you only didn't know about if it's something you were already worried about. So potentially a dog who you know had full access to water or something along those lines and are worried that they are hyponatremic. Um, so you can have acid-based arraignments, congestive heart failure, acute kidney injury. So all those same things apply for both because of what you're doing um, in regards to diuresis in these patients. But again, it is a low risk except for the hyponatremic patients. You do not want to be giving this in your hyponatremic patients. Um, again, that central pontine myelinolysis. So just so you all remember, usually what ends up happening is your axons dehydrate. And when that happens, it pulls them away from the myelin. And so you end up with severe injury. And usually it's not something that you see acutely. Usually it's a couple days after you've given hypertonic saline. You actually usually end up with a normal sodium. Um, but usually the effects are seen three, four days later as you're dehydrating the brain tissue. Um, hypertonic saline are those patients that are hypervolemic. Um, it is something that I'll reach for hypertonic saline in those cases over mannitol. So going between the two, again, I don't think it it matters. I just happen to choose mannitol because I like to give mannitol. Um, but hypertonic saline is also great. If it's right there, use it. Comparing the two, those are the doses just for comparison for you guys. And just remember, mannitol you don't want to give with your hypovolemic patients. Hypertonic saline you don't want to give with your hyponutremic patients. Honestly, besides that, there's really no difference between using either or. So whatever you have available to you, whatever you're comfortable with, again, just remember one doesn't work, try the other. Um, mannitol, just to remember to use the incubator and to use the filter because of the crystals that can form. And then hypertonic saline, you just have to be careful for phlebitis, of course. So you just wanna be cautious with that. If you're able to get a central line, awesome. Um, but just be cautious, but usually normal doses aren't gonna cause any sort of concern. So going back to Frank, so he had periods of being semi-comatose to being delirious the longer he was there. Um, initially, we were worried about the Cushing's reflex. He did have normal thoracic auscultation, no other appreciable wounds trauma. So I gave him mannitol. He was already on IV fluids and flow by. And one thing I just want to mention, so when I usually am giving mannitol, I say go big or go home. So usually I'll go a gram per keg over 15 minutes. Um, it's a large quantity. So I also think that's something just to make sure you guys are realizing or your technicians are realizing so they're not giving, you know, one mil of mannitol and are seeing what's going to happen. So if you have a five kilogram dog, they're going to be getting approximately 25 mils. So it's a 20% concentration. 
And so that's 200 megs per mil and you're one gram per pig. So five grams, 5,000 milligrams, so you're gonna be giving 25 mils. So just remember, you're always gonna be giving a large amount of mannitol just because I've number of times where, you know, people have drawn up five mils or something and um, it, it could help, but it's probably not going to. So just remember that. So after we gave Frank his mannitol, he was feeling much better, except his blood pressure was still around 140, but his heart rate had improved. So for him, for sure, we wanted to make sure we had appropriate analgesia on board. I like fentanyl because it's short acting. We can reverse it if we need to. So I gave him a little fentanyl bolus and then we went ahead and followed it with a CRI anywhere from three to five. Um, don't like to go much above five because it can make them more delirious. Um, and that's micrograms per cake per hour. Blood work, if you haven't already done it, most of these patients come in, you guys are placing an IV catheter, pulling blood work at the same time, which is great. And then something else to always consider in these patients, once they're stabilized, of course, is doing survey thoracic head and spinal radiographs. And again, that gentle spinal palpation. And oftentimes in these cases, I'll say just start with laterals. If you don't see anything really concerning um, potentially, or if you're suspicious of an area and you're not sure, you could always do a VD at that point. However, the majority of these patients, I say just do laterals, because if you do have a spinal fracture, you don't want to be manipulating their spine around to get that second view. Um, the lateral will suffice with the information that you need. And then you're going to go ahead and do the modified Glasgow coma scale. So this is something where it's a grading of your initial neurologic status with serial monitoring of the patient. The higher the score, the better the prognosis. And we basically score it on a scale of three to 18. And there's three kind of categories that we're looking at. So you're looking at level of consciousness, motor activity, and brainstem reflexes. I always say it's really easy just to print this out um, and just have it around your hospital. And then you can just quickly circle the score for your patient. And going through it, it's really important to monitor the trend of the score. I don't necessarily come up with a prognosis right away when I get, if I get a score of three, well, that's really bad, but I don't necessarily make all of my calls up of that one score. It's absolutely gonna be going forward from there and seeing, okay, well, what is my trends with this patient? I also wanna know, okay, well, my patient started with a great score. He started at 16, but then as the day goes on or the hours go on, if all of a sudden I'm at a 12 and then an eight, something's gotta change because that's not looking good. So in regards to the level of consciousness, um, again, you're scoring one to six, anywhere from comatose to occasional periods of alertness and responsive to environment. That's usually they're pretty normal, but maybe they're not 100%. It's a very subjective score. And usually it can just be helpful. The more that you do it, the more that you can say, okay, this is what I'd normally give this patient. It's not make or break. It's not if you get a score of, you know, three, your patient's not going to make it, though it is very grave. But so just know the more often you do it, the more beneficial it's going to be. And then for motor activity, you're looking at a normal gait versus hemiparesis versus if they're recumbent. It's important to see if they have intermittent versus constant extensor rigidity, and usually that'll be of all four limbs. If you've got hypotonia of muscles, so if there's no tone, um, that's usually a very poor prognosis, unfortunately. Um, however, again, not necessarily going to call everything from that. And then in regards to your brainstem reflexes, normal PLR and oculocephalic. So when I say oculocephalic, I just say make sure that you know that potentially there is no sort of cervical trauma that has occurred. But usually I'll just check for physiologic nystagmus because that can be very beneficial. You're going to be looking at pupil size. Um, you want to know where those are and where they potentially go. Because if you have meiosis that moves to hemodriasis, that's unfortunately not a good prognosis. And what I'll always say in regards to what actually matters, dogs and cats, they don't need a lot of forebrain function. They don't have to drive cars. They don't have to do math. They really need very minimal forebrain function in order to have a good quality of life. And so if they have a poor brainstem reflex score, I'm very concerned about them. But if they have a good brainstem score, but they have a horrible level of consciousness, even if they're in a coma, a lot of those patients can do remarkably well if you're just able to give them some time. So just to go back to the scoring system, so you're gonna add up your three scores that you're gonna be giving, um, and you have the categories one, two, or three, and then you're either gonna be, if you have a score to three to eight, you're gonna be grave, up to 14, guarded, 15 to 18, good. 
And again, this is based on, this isn't a one-time score. You're usually looking to see the trends of the scores that you're obtaining. And again, this is just my little, my little segue for giving these guys time. The number of dogs that we have seen that will come in pretty much comorous or stuporous, but they still have good physiologic nystagmus. You know, their pupils haven't gone from meiosis to midriatic. They have PLRs or at least some PLR. Um, those patients can do well. But of course, the problem that we run into is time. Time not only if these patients are laterally recumbent and need time being in the hospital, being appropriately cared for, um, of course, that comes with a big, a big uh, cost as well. Um, but as much as we can give these dogs time, a lot of them can do, can do really well. But that ends up being one of our limiting factors, unfortunately, for these patients. But just remember, if they have good brainstem function, these dogs can do remarkably well. And a lot of them can get to the point that they can go home with the owners for further care to see what we're able to get back. And when I say time, you're hoping to see improvement within a couple of days. And then going on from there, you want to continue to see improvement. However, it can take months for these dogs to get back to normal. And I think that's one of the really hard things because these owners are dedicating a lot of their time, a lot of their emotion, of course, to these pets, and we don't know what, what's going to come of it. So it's definitely a big, a big concern for the for the owners, which I, I definitely get. But if we're able to give them some time, I usually say even if you can just give them a couple of days and see if there's a little bit of improvement, then usually there's some hope there. And in regards to Frank, so going back to my little um, husky puppy that was bit on the head by the German Shepherd. Um, so he overall, when he I did this basically kind of after he got some of his mannitol dose on board, because of course you're not going to stop treating your patients to say, Oh, hold on. First thing I have to do is give mannitol or give this, or I have to do my Glasgow coma scale. This can come after you can always look back on it and say, okay, this is approximately what it would have been. So just make sure you're treating the patient first. And then if you're able to just try to have the score on board so that you're able to monitor those trends. So he was given a score of 12, which actually is, it's guarded, but it's not terrible. Um, and so with him, we were thinking, what are the next steps for this dog? So advanced diagnostics is definitely where you're going to go with these patients if you're able to do so. CT versus MRI, everybody knows I'm usually always pushing towards MRI for most things. And MRI can be very beneficial for head trauma patients because we can look for certain findings on the MRI to know what their potential prognosis is gonna be in regards to brain shifts and things of that nature. However, in this case, or in any case that I'm suspicious has a fracture, um, CT is great. CT is really good at looking at bone and hemorrhage, which are the two main things that we want to be seeing in these patients. And then also it's fast. It's a really short anesthesia. You don't want to be having these patients under anesthesia for a long time if you don't need to. And it also allows you to potentially correct a problem immediately if need be. Um, so as we were getting Frank ready for his CT, um, of course, he started having seizures and he went into full uh, status. And so in human medicine, it's been found that AEDs are effective at decreasing early seizures, but not preventing late onset. And so it's very common in pe people that have traumatic brain injury. They're going to give an anti-seizure medication for seven days, regardless of whether or not they have had a seizure. Usually if there's a TBI, they go on anti-seizure medications and they'll be on it for seven days. If they don't have any seizures in that time frame, they'll be weaned off versus if they do have seizures, then of course those will be continued. In dogs, if they have no epileptic activity and they're in the hospital um, and they come you know, and talk to me about the case, I usually will recommend starting Keppra um, for seven days at a minimum. If they do not go on to develop seizure activity, then oftentimes we'll try to wean them off. If they have seizures, then of course we're going to continue that. Because one of the criteria for that ACVM has come up with in regards to long-term seizure management in patients and when we start anti-seizure medications is that if there's an identifiable, identifiable structural lesion present or if there's a history of brain disease or TBI, so in any of my encephalitis patients or TBI patients, if they've had a seizure, then we definitely recommend using anti-seizure medications lifelong, even if they have no further seizures. Um, and those are just some other times that you're going to. So one thing to note on here too, is I know, just so you guys know, a lot of people will say, you know, depending on when do we start seizures, if they're only every two to three months, do we need to start um, an anti-seizure medication? 
it is recommended if there's more than two seizures in a six month time frame to go ahead and start that. So going on from there, immediately diazepam versus midazolam is oftentimes what you're going to be using. Um, half make per keg is usually what I start with. If I need to give two effects, I will do that. So you definitely can go up to two mix per keg. Um, have I gone higher? Absolutely. But usually that is only because I'm then reaching for another medication to be administering. Um, you can do that IV. You also can do diazepam intranasally. If the dog comes in and you don't have an IV catheter um, present yet, you absolutely could do intranasal. Um, of course, you can do rectal as well, but why do that when you can go intranasal unless, of course, there's a lot happening. Um, in regards to midazolam, 0.1 to 0.2 mix per kg. Nice thing, you can give that IM if needed be. If you don't have IV access, of course, you can do IM with midazolam. You also can do intranasal as well. Um, and then if your seizures are persisting, despite doing either diazepam or midazolam, usually I say three times, then I'll go ahead and get them started on a CRI and I'll also add something else in. So usually we're reaching for Keppra, 30 mg per keg IV or phenobarbital, two to four mg per keg IV. I oftentimes go to Keppra first because phenobarbital, especially when you start loading it IV, as we all know, can definitely cause changes in mentation just naturally. And so sometimes it can make it a little tricky to know what's the head trauma versus what is the phenobarbital. Um, however, of course, we also want the seizures to stop. So I'll reach for Keppra first. If that doesn't work, then I'll reach for phenobarbital. And then doing the CRI. And my CRI is normally whatever dose of midazolam or diazepam that I gave to make the seizure stop. So if it took me a two mg per keg IV bolus in order to stop the seizure, then that is going to be my CRI rate that I'm going to give. Usually in patients that come in, we started a half mg per keg uh, per hour uh, CRI of diazepam. However, in these cases, like I said, you're going to set it at whatever you need it. And so it's not uncommon that these patients sometimes will need to start as high as two mix per keg IV. And just remember not to pull up too much at once. Um, so you don't want it sticking to your plastic syringe as you're giving it. Um, and also it's expensive and you don't want a ton of diazepam pulled up if your patient unfortunately um, doesn't end up, it doesn't end up well for your patient. So I try to limit just to a couple hours. Um, of course, if it's a big dog and it's a big rate, it may, you may even be doing it an hour at a time. Um, Long-term for these patients, Keppra, phenobarbital, zanisamide, there's so many options. Pregabalin is actually now generic, so you're likely, if you haven't already seen myself and Dr. Smith using it, you'll likely be seeing it a lot more um, out there now that it's much less expensive. We have that as another option. But long-term, you're going to be looking at keeping these patients on it. Even if they go years without having seizures, um, you're going to be continuing the anti-seizure drug the whole time. And so this was Frank's poor CT. Um, I don't know if you can see, there it is. So this was the main fracture that we were worried about. So there was numerous fractures associated with our maxillary bone, our ethmoid turbinates, our dorsal cribriform plate, frontal sinus, rostral calvarium, and the displacement that was caused by the calvarium, by this fracture here, um, it was causing actually significant um, compression on our brain tissue on our frontal lobe. And so we did recommend doing a decompressive crania, craniectomy for this patient. Um, and he ends up doing extremely well as we monitored him. And so a lot of times in these patients, if they have a skull fracture, if it's not causing significant compression on the brain tissue itself, usually we'll always seriously consider going in there and removing the piece of fractured um, skull that is present so due to potential complications that can arise. You also want to make sure on your CT you're not seeing any evidence of hemorrhage directly below that can become compressive. Um, a lot of times some owners will say, well, I'm not going to do it. And it's fine. A lot of these dogs will do really well unless this is causing compression. And in those cases, um, oftentimes if they're not able to do surgery based on their neurologic status, um, unfortunately it, it may not end well, but it also, I'll always say dog doesn't need much forebrain, so they can do very well. So it's not common that we have to do these cases, but it definitely is something that we can end up doing. So if this was a case that you guys had and the owner wasn't interested, if you're able to control the seizures and give the dog some time, could it be something where the dog could have done fine with? He may have. My only concern would be seizure management long term um, because that would be a major concern with this patient. So 
general care, this is just, again, a general guideline for what to do with these head trauma patients that come in. The simple things that you can do with the head elevation, staying away from their necks, of course, using your hyperosmolar therapy, ensuring that you've got appropriate oxygenation, monitoring their CO2, keeping them comfortable, urinary catheter care, rotating them, making sure they're in a well-padded area. Um, but a lot of these guys can do really good, again, if we just if we just give them time. So any immediate questions in regards to that? No, okay, spinal trauma. So vertebral fractures and luxations, they're about 6% of the cases that we see presenting for neurologic deficits indicative of spinal cord trauma. 60% of those vertebral fractures are secondary to hit by cars. Of course, we'll also see pathologic fractures as well, whether or not that's from a discospondylitis case or potentially a neoplastic process. And the neurologic deficits are gonna result from compression or contusion of your neural tissue. So that impact injury is gonna to lead to direct tissue destruction, but then that persistent decompression that is there on your spinal cord will eventually lead to demyelination. You're gonna have progressive axonal injury and then the neuronal and axonal destruction. Your pain is gonna be arising secondary to that neural compression or through direct mechanical injury and instability of those tissues. And then the goal of therapy with these cases is of course to preserve as much of the surviving neural tissue as we can and surgical versus manage medical management options for these. And they don't all require surgical intervention. Sometimes you can't do, even do surgery because of what you're seeing is one example we're going to go through. And a lot of these cases can do really good without surgical intervention. So they commonly occur in animals that have incurred other external trauma and therefore concomitant injuries to many other body systems. So you need to be making sure that you're taking care of, of course, the other injuries that are present. And obviously respiratory circulatory system can be more fatal immediately. So you need to stabilize your patients, but just be cognizant of the facts that a fracture could be present. You're gonna minimize your physical maneuvers to avoid risk of exacerbating neuronal damage. Um, many a times we have had patients who initially had pain sensation on presentation. You know, did, a spinal fracture wasn't known. You've heard many of the stories and then of course they're moved to go to take radiographs or something along those lines. And then not shortly thereafter, they are de-pain negative. And it's not necessarily because anything, you know, necessarily was done wrong, it definitely could just happen as the disease progresses, but we also just wanna make sure we're being as cautious as we can with these spines. Um, and then if you know that a fracture is present, you wanna be securing these animals. So you wanna make sure that they are secured to a sturdy board. Some animals will absolutely freak out if this is done. And in those cases, sometimes it's better just to put them in a kennel leave them be just make sure somebody is there watching them really good but i've definitely had a patient i can think of off the top of my head we tried securing him to a board and he went nuts um and it was just easier to have that patient just within the kennel not moving around at all but just being nice and quiet and rested so based on where they are these fractures are in the vertebral column is going to be based on how much neural tissue is damaged and the type of fractures that we're going to see so in the cervical spine, the spinal cord occupies a very small proportion of the canal itself, especially in the cranial cervical spine. So severe fracture luxation with minimal neurologic deficits, and they'll only present for pain. Um, so I say give warning, because this dog right here, um, gives me the heebie-jeebies to even look at. So here is C2, here is C1, as we all know, the head should not be being held on by a little thin rim of bone here. Um, this young dog was somehow alive and this young dog came in walking, was happy, just had neck pain. Um, so significant luxations can be present in the cervical spine and you're actually not gonna have significant clinical, present, clinical signs except for pain. Pain is definitely by far the most common reason that we see any sort of cervical myelopathy patients. In the cranial lumbar spine, it's different. The spinal cord occupies a very large portion of the vertebral canal, so it doesn't take much for us to see significant neurologic signs in those patients. It also matters in regards to where your gray matter versus your white matter is. So your areas of your intumescence, so your vertebrae, C4 to, C, to T3, 
and vertebrae L3 to L5, those unfortunately you're gonna have a higher risk of permanent paralysis if it is present. And in L5 in particular, if you have fractures there, and urinary incontinence is present in particular, a lower motor neuron bladder. Unfortunately, those dogs may be walking and doing great, um, or you may get them there, but they always may remain incontinent. In regards to if it's the cord affected versus the nerve, your spinal cord, it's really not good at any sort of regeneration. Um, so unfortunately, that's pretty poor. Your nerve, they, they can do good, but the issue with the nerve is that if your nerve is compressed, we can have dogs walking around doing great, but they can be so painful that we have to decompress them just to, for, for humanity. I mean, they need it. They're so, so painful that on humane grounds, they need, they need to be decompressed. So in regards to the pathogenesis, so natural forces are applied to your vertebral column. So compression, torsion, traction, flexion, extension. And the anatomy of a certain region of the spinal cord is gonna predict the type of fracture that we see. So extreme flexion of the AA, the number of dogs that run into walls is crazy. Significant flexion, you end up with dense fractures and you have AA luxations. Flexion of the lumbar spine, it's very common that we have oblique fractures of L7. Um, and then young animals, the growth plates, those are the common areas that we're gonna see. And most of the, where you're gonna have a fracture is gonna be at the area between relatively mobile and relatively immobile areas. So oftentimes that thoracolumbar reduction is gonna be a very high area where we see these fractures. And a lot of the times they don't affect your vertebral canal or your foramen. And in those cases, they oftentimes don't require surgical intervention. And so in regards to your region of the spinal cord where you are, the type of fracture and where it occurs is oftentimes inherent to the vertebrae that are there as well as your ligamentous structures. And so that's also a big piece of the puzzle of how we decide to stabilize these patients. So C1 to C7, it's a relatively uncommon area to have any sort of fractures except for A luxations. And luxations are also a lot more common without fractures in the cervical spine. But a lot of these patients, we unfortunately aren't seeing because usually if you have severe displacement, um, it's usually fatal due to respiratory um, signs that these guys will have. So usually they just die immediately. So that could be part of the reason that we don't see a lot of these guys, unfortunately. Um, and about 15% of these patients will present with pain only. T1 to T10, this is a very rare area that you're gonna have a fracture. Or if you do have a fracture luxation, a rare area that you're gonna have to do anything about. So they have very small articular facets. So there's little resistance to torsion, but those large spinous processes and ribs and all of that tissue and muscle that's there limits a lot of your movement in all three planes. And so if you have a fracture of your facet at the cranial to mid thoracic area or the spinous processes or injury to the ligaments, it's common, but it's so stable in that area that even if you have these fractures present, it's not common that you end up needing to stabilize them. T10 to L2, so your TL junction, this is the most common area that we're gonna see fractures. 50% of all of our spinal fractures occur here. You have your rigid thoracic spine and you're well muscled and therefore also rigid lumbar spine. So again, there's lots of movement here and that's why we see it in this area. We also have a change in shape in our orientation of our vertebral facets of this area. And so because it goes in your thoracic from a VD and then it shifts to being a sagittal orientation, again, it allows for more movement. Therefore, we end up at a higher likelihood of having a fracture. You also have so many different congenital anomalies that you can see in this area with all the different breeds that are out there. Um, and so because of that, we unfortunately will also see this in this area. L3 to L7, 25 to 30% of the cases that we'll see. The mid lumbar vertebrae have large articular facets and accessory processes, and they limit the motion in the sagittal plane, but they are very liable to fracture, fractures with excessive torsion. These very commonly will end up, these are the dogs that will come in and they're walking and they have this crazy fracture relaxation and you don't understand how it's possible. A lot of times with these fraction, fractures, as they kind of, tours, the dorsal column can also come off, which is a good thing if it does, because it naturally is doing a dorsal laminectomy on these patients. So you'll be surprised at the number of dogs. If you see these dogs that come in walking, a little ataxic, painful, um, but a lot of these dogs end up having a natural laminectomy. And so they themselves decompress themselves. They still need to be stabilized, but um, that's why a lot of these dogs can come in walk walking. And then your L7 fractures, it's very common that you're going to get oblique fractures here. So 
Radiographs, again, you just want to be doing lateral spinal radiographs. Five to 10% of these patients are going to have more than one fracture. So you want to be getting complete spinal films, plus or minus doing the skull as well. When you're doing AA dogs, you do not need to flex them. So if you just take a lateral and you can see an AA, you don't need to prove it to anyone that it truly is an AA by flexing them. So if you guys just get them in a neutral position, a lateral C-spine, you're going to see the AA. Just make sure you don't cut it off. Um, a lot of people, when they do cervical radiographs, will kind of end at C2. Just make sure you're getting all the way up so that we're able to truly see that AA space. Um, if you need to sedate or anesthetize these dogs, you just need to make sure you're being really cautious with them. Because, of course, as we do that, we're taking away some of that muscle tone. That muscle tone may be what is keeping that patient alive. So just make sure you're keeping them really stable. If I have patients that I'm worried, it's a Yorkie that fell off the couch or it's a Yorkie that ran into a well and a severe neck pain and before we even give them anything, it's not uncommon. We'll gently wrap their neck with a brace, um, just doing a quick little bandage to make sure they can't bench or flex or move around too crazy and then give them some sort of medication, having a technician with them, giving them some sort of analgesia to make sure that they don't end up freaking out or also ventral flexing themselves. And just because if you're suspicious of a fracture and you don't see it on radiographs, doesn't mean it's not there. A lot of them can be really tricky to see. And so if you're suspicious of it or worried, you wanna move those guys patient, uh, cautiously and do a CT if you're able to. Now, in regards to these cases, if pain sensation is vital. Um, so if you do not have pain sensation in any of these fracture patients, um, there's a less than 5% chance that they're gonna have return of function. It really is 0% chance because what has happened is that spinal cord has been transected. So I get a lot of calls saying, you know, my patient, unfortunately, is deep pain negative. You know, we think with our disc dogs, our back dogs, our quote unquote back dogs, that they have a 50% chance if you get them within 24 hours of being able to walk again with surgery, um, which they do. 50 to 60% of those dogs will be walking again after surgery. And these guys, though, is a different story. So if they do not have pain sensation, unfortunately, we're not going to get them back up. Um, we just can't say 0%, but you're only seeing those radiographs are only showing you one time point. It's not showing you what it got to get that vertebrae to be like this. And normally what has happened is this, and your spinal cord is completely transected in half. So for treatment, you want to provide an environment for that damaged tissue to heal. You want to limit further damage and relieve compression. And so in my medical cases, when you're choosing medical versus surgical, a lot of it's gonna come down to the stability. But looking at it, if you have minimal to no pain or they're very easily able to be controlled with pain medications, if they have minimal instability, and if the owner can't afford surgery or the owner isn't interested in it, and they're just gonna say, I'm not gonna do it, um, you can definitely give them a shot with medical. I would just say you need to be very, very cautious in those patients if they ha have an unstable spine. Also in those patients that are really painful because usually humane euthanasia, if we're not going to stabilize those patients because they can't be controlled on oral medications, is going to be the fairest option for them. In regards to surgical pain that can't be controlled with medications or if you have a dog with a known fracture, you try treating medically, a couple of days down the line, all of a sudden that patient deteriorates and is very painful, you're going to recommend surgery in those cases. If they are unstable, if their neurologic status is deteriorating, they were walking and then three days later, they're not walking, you're gonna recommend surgery. And then if there's severe deficits or easier to care for post-op patients. So this is also one of the reasons that surgery is nice because if you haven't gone in there and you've stabilized these dogs, number one, not only are they usually more comfortable, comfortable faster, but they're also a lot easier to manage. Uh, lateral, we want to do both right and left. Oh, just single sided is usually going to be just fine because you'll be able to see anything obvious there. The major decision, though, whenever we're looking at these is stability. And so the three column system is what we're using in veterinary medicine to be able to say is something stable or unstable. This is by no means uh, precise, I guess I would say. It just can be helpful in knowing do I need to stabilize this patient or not? So oftentimes, if we're making that decision, this is what we're looking at. It also can be helpful for you guys to know, okay, if I just have some dorsal disruption, oftentimes those dogs are stable and they don't need surgery or you guys could call, send the radiographs. If it's just a spinous process fracture, oftentimes those dogs will do just fine without having surgery. If two or more columns are disrupted, then usually we say instability is present. The downside to this is that we're basing this off of either CT or radiographs and that doesn't necessarily 
reflects the full possible range of motion of that affected site, right? So we're just seeing that in a one-time fashion, but there can be a lot of movement otherwise that's occurring in that area. So we may be missing these cases, we may call something stable and it really isn't, but this is just more of a guideline for us. And then it also doesn't necessarily show the extent of the movement that occurred initially, right? We don't know what happened to then have our vertebrae be luxated or what exactly happened to cause the fracture. And so because of that, we don't know truly how unstable something could be because we don't know what initially happened. We can just base it off of what we're able to see. So this is usually, if you hear me talk about the three column system, this is usually what we're talking about. Usually if you have a dorsal um, fracture present, you're gonna be just fine. Middle depends. It's not common to have a middle and a ventral by themselves. Um, and so usually if you have the middle or ventral compartment involved, oftentimes it will be in the unstable category. Uh, and so oftentimes we will be talking about stabilizing these patients, but again, not necessarily for all of them. So for medical management, you wanna make sure these patients are given appropriate medications. You want analgesics, anti-inflammatory. A lot of times that'll depend, NSAID versus steroid, depending on the other injuries that are present. You wanna make sure that it's safe to be giving one versus the other. Strict rest, bladder management, cervical dogs, external coaptation. This is one of our patients um, who had an AA luxation, who had came in for many, many bandage changes. Um, the owners couldn't decide on surgery. They initially didn't do surgery, so we were doing this. And then we ended up doing surgery and we just kept a very gentle bandage on them. But I wanted to show this to you guys because if you have an AA luxation, you need to make sure you go very high on the head. Basically, you wanna be right behind the eyes in these patients to make sure that they're not able to have full rotation of that uh, the C1, C2. So you have to go very, very high. And you want some sort of firmer firmer padding underneath to make sure they really can't ventroflex. Thoracic and lumbar, I've never placed an external coaptation device on a thoracic fracture or a lumbar because it's just going to lead to more issues, uh, more damage than good. And so oftentimes I won't. It's just going to be strict rest for these dogs. Um, it's going to get peed on or anything else. And so it's not something that we'll normally normally do for those patients. Now, in regards to complications, the bandages, of course, can loosen. You can get skin abrasions. You can get infections. Um, and you need to make sure these are changed twice weekly. This was a dog who, it was a young pug who had roll after roll after roll. Um, we'll see his images in a second. And he had, actually, I take that back. This is the pug whose head was trying to fall off. So we placed a bandage on him after seeing his CT and he had so many fractures that we weren't able to stabilize him. And we were worried about, because he was so young, um, I believe he was only three months at the time that we were worried about those vertebral bodies being able to hold any sort of stabilization technique. And so we did a bandage on him. And of course, being a pug, he got a nasty infection after just being on, having the bandage on for a couple of days, but luckily it did clear up. But this is also the reason that it's really important to be checking these bandages frequently to make sure that nothing happens because though it's a nice idea to be able to bandage these patients, you also have to realize it can be a big financial investment and sometimes this in itself can end up being more expensive than doing surgery um, and also can be more time consuming for the owner and for the patients. But it definitely can work out in those cases where it needs to just as in pickles because we really didn't have any other option for this dog. We could not stabilize and so we went with hopefully his young age um, to be able to help us out. He was able to heal um, on his own. So just to give you guys some quick examples of some cases. This was a C45 cervical luxation. Again, this dog didn't have any fracture. He just had the luxation, which is most common to occur in our cervical spine. So he had, she had jumped over stairs, fell down, jumped over a banister, fell down a flight of stairs, and then slammed her head into a door. Um, and so she presented with neck pain, mild tetraparesis and ataxia. So she has this pretty significant fracture that was able to be seen here on the lateral also obtained a VB. Um, and what you can see, or I can see if you guys are able to see it, but we can't interact, so it's not that easy. But basically how you have a shortened vertebral body here, you're able to outline usually because that's how your vertebral body is angled with the luxation, so it'll look shortened on your VB. And then that's an MRI image on the far right showing that luxation again with the compression on our spinal cord right here. 
this dog was stabilized. Um, we basically just had to get this dog realigned and then we put in some vertebral screws and we were able to do a PMMA concept to keep her stabilized and she did very well. And then again, for this cute dog who we just ended up medically managing. So there's a lot of times you would see this image and you think, number one, there's no way this dog is alive. And somehow he was, let alone walking. Um, but he was. And one thing just to, to recognize in this is that it had been seen on the lateral radiograph initially. Um, and then a flex view was obtained, which I know a lot of us were taught to get that flex view for any of these cases to prove if an AA luxation is present. But again, you don't, you don't need to. If you can see it on just your regular standard lateral view, I think I've only in the last five years I've been in practice done one flex view and kind of a tricky case. And so you don't need to do flex cervical views. You're usually going to be able to check it just on your lateral. And so with him, this is after at the end three months, we bandaged his neck. And here you can see after the three months being he's still a puppy. So that is growth plates open here, but he was able to heal wonderfully. So puppies do amazing things and this dog a lot of people would say there's no way he's going to be okay giving them time doing the bandage changes resting appropriate medications um and he did very well so a lot of these cases can can look really bad but they actually can end can end well and then one more just an aa luxation this is that little chihuahua that we showed again you're looking for this increased space right here between our c1 and our c2 this dog is probably a little more flex than what I would say even needs to happen on just a normal radiograph, um, but you can see his luxation very clearly. In regards to luxations, successful surgical outcome for these AA dogs, if they're less than 24 months of age and have not had signs for greater than 10 months, oftentimes they can do great with surgery um, as long as they don't have severe clinical signs as well. So that's also something that we're looking at in these patients in regards to when to do when is surgery going to be appropriate or not? If I have a dog who's had waxing and waning signs, five-year-old dog presents to me waxing and waning signs for a year, I'm very cautious in regards to if I'm actually going to be able to even improve his condition surgically, especially if he's down in all four of his limbs or something along, along those lines. But in regards to the surgical technique, a lot of people will go ventral nowadays. There's many different options out there. But just know if these guys come to you, and they're young and they have minimal effects and the people aren't able to send them for surgery. A lot of these dogs can do good with doing the stabilization, the external co-optation, as long as you're able to monitor them closely. As long as those owners will say that, well, they'll come in and see you um, twice a week to manage them or sooner if there's any concerns, they can do well. And usually I recommend two to three months for um, external co-optation in these cases, ending with radiographs to make sure everything looks like it is stable. And that was him at the end of his stabilization. And just another medical one. So this was a dog that was hit by a car, a young lab, um, who unfortunately was hit by a car. You can see she had spinous process fracture here. We also have decreased disc space here, likely because of a fracture that has occurred. She was non-ambulatory and parapretic and ataxic. Her pain was well controlled with oral medications. She had a dorsal fracture of T6, which you were not able to see um, on that radiograph. She had a spinous process fracture of T9. There was a mild subluxation at T910, which again, usually we don't worry too much about because it's pretty stable in that area already. And then she had a dorsal lamina fracture of T12. And right here in this top photo, you can actually see there was a piece of the bone actually within the canal itself. Surgery was not an option for um, this dog. So she was treated medically um, and she did great. So she did wonderfully. So she was walking one month post-op. We're always a little cautious with her. The younger the dog, the usually the more easy they're able to heal, but she did wonderfully. And so um, that was kind of a quick run through head trauma, spinal trauma, things that you guys can be looking for, knowing that if they can't come see us, you guys are still able to do quite a lot and these patients can do good um, without needing to come and, and have potentially surgery. We're more than happy to do them, but a lot of these dogs also can do really well without. And that's what I got. Any questions? I think I'm on the chat thing. I 
I think that was it. It's just Katie being Katie. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone so much for attending. As I said previously, you will get your CE certificate in the automatic email that you get um, from Webinar Ninja. Give that a couple of hours. If you don't have it by say Thursday, um, certainly email me and I will make sure that you have that. Thanks everybody so much um, for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.